welcome to my channel, to my research institute in Ardmore, Alabama. I'm the anti-type to the research institute in Ardmore, Oklahoma, you know, the world famous research institute for preterism. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> it's a spinoff of Vision International <laughs> University in California. You know, it's it's got a handful of books and got Google. It might even have DuckDuckGo. I'm not sure. I've got DuckDuckGo at my research institute, and uh, I've got Google. One of these days, I'll get rid of Google altogether. But anyway, we're going to take a dive into Don K. Preston's Challenge of Christ again. He's been going on about this for five years. It's the same video week after week after week. It really is. Every Friday morning on Morning Musings, he calls it now TV on Friday mornings. <clears throat> I don't subscribe to now TV. I believe it's mostly in Great Britain. I'm not sure. But there is an app on Roku that's it's called Now Network. And I think it's branched off from Now TV. And it has all those charismatics and Pentecostals on it. Perry Stone, Kenneth Copeland, people like that. And that may be what Don's part of. I've done, I'm not sure. But he's not on the Roku app. But he comes on every Friday morning on Now TV. And he says he has a potential for 100 million viewers. And that now TV is uh, that uh, YouTube is just a he calls it a tiny little <laughs> piece of his audience. More power to you, Don. You're world famous. But anyway, I want you to listen to a little bit of what he got to say on the challenge of Christ. Let's see. Yeah, I'm right in here. And I'll begin here, and I'm gonna make a few comments, and this. This may not be as long as the ones I do make, but it's going to be a repeat of what I've already done. And it's a shame, but he's he's been doing this almost five years. And folks, I'm going to show you, I'm going to point out to you one more time, he refuses to read the verse he built this stupid doctrine of his out of. I mean, it's insane to me. It's, it's maddening that none of his people read the Bible and call him out on it and say, Don, at least read the scriptures. We we believe you. We got it. Uh, but read read what it actually says. They won't do it. They, they won't. He might as well be Jim Jones handing out Kool-Aid. Okay, but I do appreciate you being with me. I appreciate the fact that our, our channel is growing. I appreciate the fact that I'm hearing from more and more and more people that have just recently tuned in. They're just beginning to understand a little bit about fulfilled eschatology. They're just beginning to understand that biblically, eschatology is not about the end of human history. It is rather about the end of covenant history. That is to say, it, it is about the end of the old covenant history of old covenant Israel, which occurred and the fall of Jerusalem in AD 70. And no, no, it's not. That did happen. That's part of eschatology. Things things past, things that have already taken place. You know, I forget the exact definition of eschatology. But no, it's not about Israel only, Don. It's not about covenant eschatology, the end of the old covenant. No, that's not what... Uh, there is an end to human history, this will be done away. All this creation, the Bible teaches clearly without you twisting it and messing it up and claiming it says something it don't say. This, there is an end. The Bible teaches there's an end to this creation, this history, this kingdom that God put on the earth will be presented to the Father one day. Christ bought us with His own blood. He bought, He purchased this kingdom, this church of His. And then 
as 1 Corinthians 15 teaches, He will present us to the Father. It's that simple. Jesus said, Heaven and earth pass away, but my words will by no means pass away. That's what that means. His kingdom, His church, who were saved by His word, will spend eternity with Him when this creation is done away. And we're going to listen to you a little bit more, and then I'm going to point out some verses. Versus the view, as we're going to talk about this morning, that the Bible predicts the end of time. The Bible does, Second Peter 3, and we're going to go over that after a while. A time when Jesus would come out of heaven at the day of the Lord, and the earth and the elements that, that are therein that would be burned up, Second Peter chapter 3. And right, Second Peter chapter 3. And verse 10, which is the key passage that people appeal to, to prove. No, 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 no. We don't take just one verse out of Second Peter chapter 3. Peter begins by comparing what's coming to the flood. I'm going to go over that too. I, I'm going to let you ramble for a little bit here, and then I'll people will understand what I'm getting at. Proof of yet future day of the Lord. Well, folks, I don't know about you, it's a pet peeve of mine, but lip smacking, <laughs> lip smacking drives me nuts. <laughs> but I listen to this just to. I get through it just, just to show you if there's one of his viewers listening, that's, I don't care. But I'm the only one that has paid attention to this challenge of Christ doctrine of his that he invented. And it's, it's, it's so maddening and aggravating that nobody looks and reads and, and sees what he's saying. And <laughs> that's the only reason I'm doing this. But, uh, but I, as I said, the lip smacking is just a, another nail in my shoe and had to put up with it. What? Rock, not nail. <laughs> what my series is doing, and I've been doing this now for several years here on the... Right, he has. <laughs> he ain't arguing with me over that. Now, TV, we are talking about the challenge of Christ. If you haven't gone back, if you haven't watched a bunch of the previous videos, then let me very, very quickly remind you, our new viewers, of what the challenge of Christ is. Because it, it really bothers me a great deal. Kind of like your lip smacking bothers me a great deal. I mean, that, you know, that's nothing. I, I know you. it's just a habit. I say any way. <laughs> that's a habit. And uh, that's a, you know, maybe that gets on your nerves. I don't know. But your lip smacking, it's, it bothers me a great deal. When people who claim to be Christians, okay, who affirm a faith in Jesus Christ and who say that the Bible is the word of God, and yet they do not seem to be aware of the challenge of Christ. There's a reason for that, folks. It's not the challenge of Christ that he's talking about. It's the challenge of Don K. Preston. It's the script, the twisting of Scripture of John 10, 37. That's what people are not aware of. They will look at him like he's got three heads because he'll come up with this uh, challenge of Christ and he'll claim John 10, 37 says something that it does not say. And people who don't have a Bible in their hands, they will look at him, well, I have never read that before. Of course they will because it, it's not in the Bible. It's not there. The challenge of Christ that Don K. Preston is talking about does not exist. It's not in there. And in order to understand this even a little bit more, I'm going to take just a little bit of an aggression here. What Jesus said in, his, in issuing his challenge is not a new challenge at all. Okay, folks, he's fixing to go into... Isaiah and uh, probably Daniel 9 again. Uh, it just, he, he repeats the same thing every week. And 
he he's going to get on up in here before let's say it's around nine fifty somewhere along in that when he says what the verse what he claims the verse says and it doesn't say. Let me try here. I think this is about where he where he's at when he claims to be quoting John ten thirty seven. Was I mean it's absolutely astounding. Now then we come forward to the challenge of Christ. Yeah, this word's at which is John chapter ten and verse thirty seven. Listen carefully, folks, and then we're gonna read John ten thirty seven once again because he will not. He will not do it. And he twisted it to mean Jesus had no intention for it to mean what Don K. Preston claims it does. That's why people will look at him funny and say, I've never heard that before. There's a reason. He didn't say it. In John 10, 37, he doesn't say it. He says something close to it to Philip, specifically to Philip, in John 14, but he does not tell those Jews around him who wanted to kill him in John 10. He does not say what Don K. Preston claims he does. Listen to him. Jesus said, if I do not do the works which my Father has given me, do not believe me. Do not believe me for my works, or excuse me, for my words' sake. Believe me for my works. Okay, folks, if uh, if that's what Jesus said, all of us are in a mess because we weren't around to see him do the works. We weren't there. We've got the word, the word by which we are saved. We have it. We believe in it. We put our faith in it, not in watching somebody do like Kenneth Copeland do the works. We're going to read John 10, 37, where, it, it, you know, it, it makes me mad, folks. It, it does. It makes me mad that he has the nerve to misquote Jesus that bad just to sell his doctrine and sell his books. Now, that that's... I watch Chris Roseboro quite a bit. He's a Lutheran. But, you know, folks... <laughs> Even a Baptist is right sometimes. <laughs> no, I'm just, I'm just teasing. Don't get mad at me. <clears throat> but he's Chris Roseboro is really smart. But you can tell when somebody, one of those uh, Copeland types, hit a nerve with him, he will stay on it and make his point. And it, and you can see it in his eyes when when it really bothers him. That's the way I feel on this. When Don K. Preston talks about John ten thirty seven and and he tries to pretend it goes on to thirty eight, but he's got it so out of whack it does not mean what Jesus said. But anyway, here we go. I'm going to read John ten thirty seven. If I do not do the works of my Father, do not believe me, folks. Do you understand what the works of my Father are? We do the works of Jesus' Father. He's our Father too. In Ephesians, uh, <clears throat> where is it? Uh, well, in Ephesians, we're told we do the works. We live by those works the Father created beforehand. We are saved by grace through faith, not of ourselves, lest anyone should boast. The works that we do were created. They, they're the Father's works. The works of my Father is what I try to live by. That's, that's what Ephesians teaches. If we belong to the Father, we will do those works He created for us to do. And that's what Jesus is saying. If I do not do the works of my Father, do not believe me. But if I do, Though you do not believe me, believe the works, that you may know and believe that the Father is in me and I in him. Jesus is not saying, if I do not do the works, oh, no, let me. he's not saying what Don K. K. Preston says. 
Don K. Preston, let's repeat what he says. Jesus does not say this. If I get my mouse going. If I do not do the works which my Father has given me, do not believe me. See, he doesn't say that. If I do not do the work, in a way that's right, but he finishes it with, listen to this. Do not believe me for my works, or excuse me, for my words sake, believe me for my works. See, he does not say that, does not mean that, and we cannot live by that because we weren't there to witness Jesus. He was talking to those Jews in John chapter 10. It's called audience relevance, Don, if you had never heard that term. Well, you have because you use it when it's convenient only. Do not believe me for my words, say, believe me for my works. That's Don saying that's a command. Jesus didn't tell us that. He says, if I do not do the works of my Father, do not believe me. Jesus was doing the works of the Father, and he was teaching his disciples how to do the works of the Father. If you'll remember, in uh, John chapter 8, Jesus was talking to those Jews who wanted to kill him, and he taught them, which is one of the reasons they wanted to kill him, he said, they, they were bragging that they do the works of their father, Abraham. Jesus said, no. If you did the works of Abraham, you would accept me. Abraham did the works of the father. And, and Abraham would have believed Jesus. Jesus said so. He said, if you were doing the works of Abraham, you would believe me. You do the works of your father, the devil. That's what Jesus is saying. And then here he's saying, I do the works of my father. If I don't, don't believe me. But he was doing it. So that was a that was a hypothetical that Jesus was was actually doing the works of the Father. He was also doing more works which are, were of the Father that the Father gave him specifically to do. Jesus healed, he raised the dead. Why did he do all those miracles? John chapter 20 tells us why. So we would believe that he was the Son of God, and through him we would be saved. That's what the, all of that combined does. Don rips out John 10, 37, says if Jesus didn't come back in 87, he'd do, Jesus, he says, Jesus is saying, if I do not do the works... He has said it in different videos. If I do not do what I say I'm going to do, do not believe me. That's not what Jesus said either. And Don has said that in many videos in the past. He's been doing this for five years. He is deceiving intentionally. He's This is on purpose. This is not by accident because it's been pointed out. And before he blocked me on this stuff, I asked him, what is John 10, for, uh, excuse me, what does John 17, 4 mean? When Jesus said, I have finished the work which you have given me to do. And Don never did answer that. He just, well, you know, and he just stumbled around, goes right back to misquoting Jesus, and then later on refers to him as a five foot five Jewish man riding on the clouds. You know, he's so disrespectful to the Lord and has, has no fear of him. But am I making sense, folks? This to me, this is this is so simple. The works of the Father. What did he tell his apostles, his disciples? Most assuredly I say to you, he who believes in me, the works that I do, he will also do. He will do also. And greater works than these he will do, because I go to my Father. And whatever is Whatever you ask in my name, that I will do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask anything in my name, I will do it. Jesus is talking to his disciples. They were going to do the works of the Father also, and even greater works. Because Jesus was going, he knew he was going to the Father, going back to the Father. He would send the Comforter. Remember that, folks? Jesus is not saying. If I do not do the works my Father give me, 
Do not believe me. Do not believe me for my words. Say, believe me for my works. He did not tell them that, and Don knows that, and he will not read the verse. He has not studied John, the book of John, and I've been I've read the first five chapters so far, and I'm going to finish that. I'm going to read chapter six in a day or two, maybe this weekend. But to me, this is so simple. But here's something he said to Philip, specifically to Philip, that Don is conflating with what he said in John 10, 37. Philip said, Lord, show us the Father, and it is sufficient for us. Jesus said to him, Have I been with you so long, and yet you have not known me, Philip? He who has seen me has seen the Father. So how can you say, show us the Father? Do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father in me? The words that I speak to you, I do not speak of my own authority, but the Father who dwells in me does the works. Believe me that I am in the Father and the Father in me, or else believe me for the sake of the works themselves. He's talking to a, a, an apostle here, folks. He's not talking to everybody in the world. He's talking to Philip. Philip has seen those miracles he's been doing, and he said, have I been with you so long and done these things, and you, you ask me, show us the Father? That's what I've been teaching you, Philip. What I'm doing proves that the Father is in me, and, and I am in the Father. Philip, believe me that I am in the Father, and the Father in me, or else believe me for the sake of, sake of the works themselves. Then he goes on to tell them that they will do greater works than he did. You will also do the works of my Father, because I go to the Father. That's so simple, folks. But Don, here he is. Well, if he doesn't come in AD 70, don't believe him. That's what Jesus is teaching us. No, that's not what Jesus is teaching us. Don K. Preston does not know what Jesus is teaching, folks. He really doesn't. Because he went on and on years ago on this challenge of Christ that Jesus raised himself from the dead. That was one of the works that he was doing. The Father raised Je The Bible teaches, it's clear. The Father didn't allow his body to see corruption. The Father raised him from the dead. Jesus was submissive. He submitted him, not my will, but yours. Remember, folks, in the Garden of Gethsemane? Jesus submitted fully to the Father. Not my will, but yours. That's what Christ wanted. That's what Jesus wanted. The, he knew the Father. If he obeyed the Father, did the Father's will, did the works. If He knew if he did the works of his Father, the Father would not allow him to remain in the grave. He would resurrect him. He knew that. And that's he completely submitted, and the Father raised him from the dead. Don K. Preston says, Jesus raised himself from the dead. When I pointed that out a couple of times, he did stop that. He stopped teaching that. He understands, I believe. You know, he's right. He didn't raise himself. He submitted to the Father. But that's what I'm saying. He, Don K. Preston studies the scholars. He does not study the scriptures. He hasn't, and he, and he probably never will. If it ain't in Daniel 9... And if Isaiah, you know, certain prophecies in the Old Testament, if that's not on his radar, he's not going to read it. He's not going to study it. John is too, too much. The book of John, the gospel of John, it's too much for us. Don wants it to be about 80, 70, and it's not. Uh, let me see what else he had here. He had something about... Let me see if he gets to Second Peter 3. That's the challenge of Isaiah in Isaiah's day concerning the pagans. Now that, that had not to, what we just talked about was John 10, 37, where he misquotes Jesus. <laughs> Isaiah wasn't talking about that either. Uh, that's not what Isaiah was talking about. And they're prophets. But now here's Jesus speaking of himself say, do not believe me simply because I can utter words that ostensibly foretell something. 
Jesus, yes, Jesus says, believe me for my words. We do that. What did he say in John again? John 20. Blessed are those who will not see yet believe. Thomas had to, touch, had to put his hand in the wounds. Jesus knew one day there's, there's coming a day when no people will not see anything. His word, heaven and earth pass away. My words will by no means pass away. We have the word. That's what saves our soul. That's what we live by. We didn't see anything. And no, we don't believe Kenneth Copeland can kill COVID-19. I mean, good grief, Don. 70 AD is ancient history. The ruins are barely there now. That's not what Jesus was talking about in Matthew 24, 36. That's, there is going to be an end to this creation. And I want to point out one other thing, folks. I think I'm through with Don Preston right now on this one. I had, uh, I don't remember exactly where he's talking about Second Peter three again, but Second Peter three is telling of the coming day of the Lord, and he refers back to the flood, Noah's flood. Let me see how much time I got left on the clip, champ. Okay, let me stop for a second, and then you won't even know I'm going. I'm gonna stop, and then we're gonna read Second Peter three, Second Peter three, and I'm gonna point out a couple of things in Genesis one, and I'll be right back. And you won't even know I'm going. Well, all right. Well, okay, I'm back. <laughs> you see, you didn't even know I was gone. And I took a break and made some coffee. And I'm going to take us up here in a minute. But <clears throat> I took a glance. Where did he, where was he talking about Second Peter 3 in here? I, could, I don't know where it's at, folks. In this video, it's in there somewhere. But I'm going to go through it again. Like I said, I've... <clears throat> This whole week, I've kept everything saved the way it is, and because uh, I didn't feel like doing that, took some treatments. It kind of knocked me down this week. But I'm going to point out. He says Second Peter three, they, and uh, you know they all teach that the hyperpreterists is what they teach. The destruction of heaven and earth is talking. It's not talking about heaven and earth. It's talking about old covenant. The old covenant law, the temple, and the most holy place and the temple. Some of them say it's talking about the temple in Jerusalem. Some say it's talking about the most holy being heaven, and then the rest of the temple being earth. And no, it's not, folks. Second Peter three. I'm going to read my, uh, a lot of it, <laughs> beginning in verse one, and. and this is why it's so important to, to read a lot of it. It gets it in its proper context. What is Peter talking about? What is going to be destroyed? Well, let's look and see. Now, I write, beloved, I now write to you the second epistle in both of which I stir up your pure minds by way of reminder that you may be mindful of the words which were spoken before by the holy prophets and of the commandment of us, the apostles of the Lord and Savior, knowing this first, that scoffers will come in the last days, walking around in their own lust. And this is one area I will agree on the hyperpreterists. Those last days were there too. They, were, they began there. Of course, they say, well, it's 2,000 years later. We can't still be in the last days. Well, sure we can, folks. I'm not, I'm not one to tell God how long a day is or, or when, when the last days are. He decides that, not us. And saying, where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. For this they willfully forget that by the word of God the heavens were of old 
and the earth standing out of water and in the water. Let me ask you folks, is that talking about uh, before the temple and and the Jerusalem and the holy place were even created? Of course not. For by which the world that then existed perished, being flooded with water. But the heavens and the earth, which are now preserved by the same word, are reserved for fire until the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. Okay, he's talking about the, the world then, before Noah. It perished by a flood. But now the heavens and earth are preserved by the same word until the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. This place is going to go up in flames. He's talking about this create. How do we know that? Let's go back to Genesis 1. Genesis 1 1 defines pretty much what heaven and earth, the heavens and the earth. It defines it. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. That's the definition of, well, what are they talking about? Peter talked about, you know, in Genesis, we were taught the flood. Eight people were saved from the flood. Everything else was destroyed. And that same earth is that was that perished then is being held in reserve until judgment and the perdition of ungodly men. But beloved, do not forget this one thing that the Lord with the Lord one day is as a thousand years and a thousand years is a day. And I'm not one to advocate that that's a literal thousand years. No, I'm not. That's saying we don't know how long it is. Peter didn't know. Don't worry about it. God knows. And that's why in Matthew 24, 36, Jesus says no man knows that day and hour. Not even the Son Himself. Matthew 24 is talking about the temple being destroyed and Jerusalem being sacked and all that. Sure it is. But it's also talking about a day of judgment of all people and a resurrection. 1 Corinthians 15 is talking about the resurrection. The Lord is not slack concerning His promise as some count slackness, but is long-suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. God knows when all those who are His will repent. He knows the la- He knows when when it's time. We don't know. No man knows. But He's He's not slack concerning His promise. But He's just willing that none should perish. He knows who will repent and who won't. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night. That's another thing, folks. If the Lord's coming as a thief in the night, why did it take the Romans so long to surround the temple? They just, did you realize how long they stood there defending the temple? Rome had a hard time destroying the temple. The Jews defended it bravely and mightily, whatever you want to call it. It took time. It took, they surrounded Jerusalem for months, or at least the temple, I forget. Overall, it took about three years to get the armies around Jerusalem. You remember Jesus said, when you see it, Jerusalem being surrounded, flee. That's the destruction of Jerusalem. So how can that be like a thief in the night? Is a thief in the night going to come announcing and, and banging and, until he knocks down your door? No, he's going to come in a surprise. He's going to come as a thief in the night in which the heavens will pass away with a great noise and the elements will melt with a fervent heat. Both the earth and the works that are in it will be burned up. That's not talking about the temple, folks. It ain't. Therefore, since all these things will be dissolved, what manner of person ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness? And I don't know if you can hear my dogs barking through the microphone or not, but I've got too little ruins that just bark 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 will not shut up (laughs) but i'm not going to interrupt them whatever they're barking at (laughs) they have fun looking for and hastening the coming of the day of god because of which the heavens will be dissolved being on fire and the elements 
will melt with fervent hate. Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. Therefore, beloved, looking forward to these things, be diligent to be found by him in peace without spot and blameless. And that's hard to do, folks. And consider that the long suffering of our Lord is salvation. As also our beloved brother Paul, according to the wisdom given to him, has written to you. As also in all his epistles, speaking of them, of these things in which some are hard to understand, which untaught and unstable people, wink, wink, Don Gay Preston, twist to their own destruction, as they do also the rest of the scriptures, John 10, 37. You therefore, beloved, since you know the know this beforehand, beware lest you fall from your own steadfastness, being led away with the error of the wicked, but grow in the grace of the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To Him be the glory, both now and forever. Amen. This creation, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The heavens which are now will be dissolved. Second Peter three twelve. The elements of this earth. This is going to fa- uh, the it's going to melt with fervent heat. We look for a new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwell. That's our hope, folks. Don will they they denigrate the resurrection. Don says, First Corinthians fifteen is about the new covenant. Well, I, to tell you the truth, I don't know what that, they're saying that the resurrection is corporate Israel, not the resurrection of of all souls. That you know, some will be, they will be divided left and right, sheep and goats, and Jesus will allow the sheep in, the goats will be cast away. That's not talking about uh, everybody, according to Don K. Preston. That's just talking about. Uh, Israel, old co- yeah, let me make it plain. Old covenant Israel. See, Don's almost into that Israel only doctrine, and I want to go to First Corinthians at fifteen. I should have had this pulled up already. I thought I did. But I wanted to point out. I, my brain is forgetting why, why I wanted to go over this. Yeah, Don, in that video, he talked about, and the one he did this morning. See, this is an older video, but he says the same thing every week. It's all, it's, I could go back and do the first one he did on this, and it'd be the same as the one he did today. But he's talking about 1 Corinthians 15 as a corporate Israel. And I keep forgetting. When Jesus said, or when Paul said, Jesus will, then comes in, then he will, let me get to it. Okay, let let me read from verse 20 and go down to 28 this is the point i want to make but now christ is risen from the dead and has become the first fruit of those who have fallen asleep for since by man came death by man also came the resurrection of the dead for as in adam all die even so in christ all shall be made alive but each one in his own order Christ's first fruits, afterward those who are Christ at his coming. Then comes again when he delivers the kingdom to the God the Father, when he puts an end to all rule and all authority and power. For he must reign till he has put all enemies under his feet. The last enemy being destroyed is death. For he has put all things under his feet. But when he says all things are put under him, it is evident that He who put all things under him is accepted. Now when all things are made subject to him, then the Son himself will also be subject to him who put all things under him, that God may be all in all. 
folks, listen. When if this this is this creation going to be destroyed, at the same time, Christ's kingdom lasts forever. It does. It's it's eternal. It will never be destroyed from its founding on the day of Pentecost till the, this creation is destroyed. The kingdom lasts forever. This is how. This earth is not our kingdom. This is where we're, we're sojourners and pilgrims. This world, this is temporary. This is going to pass away like rust and gold. Where you lay your treasures up. We don't lay up treasures for eternity, as such as gold and silver and all of that. We do the will of the Father. As we do that, we are laying up treasures in heaven. That's what's going to last forever. This we The kingdom lasts forever. We will never die. Though we die, we shall live. These bodies, we will put them off. 1 Corinthians 15 talks about the resurrection. There's going to be a resurrection. They claim, no, this is to corporate Israel. And then they say, some of them are teaching out, it's an ongoing, every day is a resurrection. You know, ridiculous. They come up with, Preston has come up with some of the most ridiculous doctrines I have ever heard. But he rears back and talks about scholars, scholars. But he does not know the scriptures at all. He doesn't, folks. He, you know, you would think he should know them at like the back of his hand. But if you spend day after day after day talking about one thing, one thing only, he for, he forgets some of the stuff that he has he had learned when he was a child. He has. He's forgot it because he hasn't studied. This realm, this physical realm we're in, that's not what we look forward to. We look forward to heaven with the Father, that spiritual realm where our immortal, we will put off this mortal. This mortal body can't live forever. We put it off. We put on the spiritual body, whatever that is. It may look just like this. You know, if you think back to uh, the prophet Samuel, uh, yeah, Samuel, when he was... When he come up, when that witch called him up, which I think the father called him up, but allowed the witch to take credit because it even scared her. But Saul recognized Samuel, even though Samuel was dead. He recognized him. That's Samuel. That may be what, you know, it's a hint of what we're going to be. Of course, John tells us in First John, it has not been revealed yet what we shall be. But we know when he comes back, when he's revealed, we will be like him. We will see him as he is, and we will be like him. Whatever that is, it hadn't been revealed yet. Preston says it has been revealed and we're living in it. You know, where righteousness dwells, this is this is it, according to Don. that We are in the new heaven, new earth, and we're living where righteousness dwells. And, you know, it's nonsense. We look forward to the resurrection. When this is done, then we put on immortality. That's a hope. Christ will deliver us to the Father. Then he is subjected to the, he's subject to the Father. Whatever that means, folks, I can't explain it. You know, the three are one the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, those are one. They're three unique individuals, yet they are one. That's the Godhead. How to explain, well, how does the Son submit back to the Father? As someone who who has been there, you know, we don't know, folks. It's not yet been revealed. But we do know what the Bible tells us. We know what the Apostle Paul, who was divinely inspired, said. When all things are made subject to him, then the Son himself will also be subject to him who put all things under him, that God may be all in all. That's what it means. 
Christ will present us to the Father. If I go back to John 10, 37. If I do not do the works of my Father, do not believe me. But if I do, though you do not believe me, believe the works that you may know the Father is in me and I in him. That's what that means, folks. Jesus was sent to save the world. John 3.16 the word's going to live, it's going to abide forever. When the end comes to this creation, the word will abide forever. It does not matter. The word does not live or die based on this creation. It lives forever. And that's all it is to it. It's in, it's in our spirit. It's in our, we put the word in us. And however that's going to be, our, immor our immortal bodies will know the Word because it's going to last forever. And if we live by it today, we will live forever. We will not perish. There's going to be a resurrection of the dead. There's going to be a judgment. And if you haven't, if you believe the Word, you've heard it, you believe it. He tells us, confess Christ as the Son of God. Romans 10, 9. And he tells us in Acts 2 to 38 to repent and be baptized for the remission of sins. And we will receive that gift of the Holy Spirit. That word, you know, we receive that gift of the Holy Spirit. It's eternal life. It's the word. It's, we study, we begin to grow. We, uh, you know, First Peter 1, I think it is, talks about if we, here, it's either First Peter one or Second Peter one. I'm getting six. I'm sixty five years old, folks. I, I can't remember exactly like I used to. But if we obey Christ, we will grow. We will. We will learn more and more. And I need to learn more and more. I do. I, that's just part of it. But if we think we've learned it all, then we're in trouble. But that's what we do. We walk a new life. We're born. That's what, you know, unless a person told Nicodemus when Jesus told him, unless you are born again, you will by no means see the kingdom of heaven. That's how we're born again. We confess Christ. We repent. We're baptized. And we are risen a new creature. We are a new creation in spirit when we are raised from the dead. But there's going to be a new heaven and a new earth. And this immortal, this mortal body will put on immortality. First Corinthians fifteen. Read it. It's it's clear as a bell. But they believe no. That's talking about corporate Israel. Think of it like this, folks. <clears throat> Corinth was full of Roman Gen. It was Gentiles, pagans. They had some Jews, but he's writing to pagans. Long ways from Jerusalem. Jerusalem meant nothing to them. They didn't make pilgrimages, pilgrimages to Jerusalem every year. They didn't. They come out of idol worship and, and all that. You know, he wrote a wrote the letter to them and tell them, getting on that one brother that was uh, sleeping with his father's wife. You know, no, you can't do that. You're a Christian now. Put that away. Get away from that. And he did repent on the second letter that Paul wrote to him. That these Gentiles, they didn't care about Jerusalem. They didn't care about the first covenant. That's They were under the new covenant. Paul was preaching the gospel of Christ that saves everyone, both Jew and Gentile. Remember Romans 1.16? The, the gospel of Christ is the power of God to salvation, to the Jew first, then also to the Gentiles. This is not about, 1 Corinthians 15, the resurrection is not about corporate Israel. It's about mankind. And it's about when this creation is destroyed, we will be presented back to the Father. The Son himself will be subject to the Father because in Matthew 28, 18, remember Christ said, All authority has been given to me. The one who gave him will be accepted when all things is put under him. 
the one who has accepted is God the Father. He was not put under Christ. He was given all authority, but he's accepted from all authority. Christ cannot tell the Father what to do. Your will, not mine, Jesus says. And when when it's time, when he comes, when he returns, he will present us to the Father. The kingdom will last forever. This is an eternal kingdom. That's how. That's how it's eternal. This mortal will put on immortality. This world will not stand forever. Even science tells us that. Don says science is what he goes by. No, it's not. He goes by pseudoscience. We see this place rotten and we see people die every day. We see trees die. We see grass die. This is a this is a a a, dis, a destruction in progress, so to speak, or a decay in progress. But when he says it's time, he will come. And it will be in the blink of an eye. It won't be with a Roman army surrounding, giving us time to leave. You know, China's not going to be, we're not prophesied. When you see this happening, you know that the time is short. Get out of there. There's nowhere to run, folks. When he comes again, it's going to be in the blink of an eye, and this place will be burned up. Judgment is not going to be waiting in line. <laughs> it's not. We will be judged and put in our place at the blink of an eye. It's going to be quick. And, well, anyway, that's all I had to say today, folks. And I'm going to read uh, John chapter 6 in a day or two and post it too. But that's what I have on this for today. And I appreciate you listening. I'm trying to think if there's something I'm forgetting. But anyway, thank you for tuning in. And I'll see you next time.